Hey guys, my name's Radek, and I'm your TA for Microeconomics 1 BO3. So this is Chapter 6, and what is Chapter 6? Well, we'll be exploring um, price ceilings, price floors, rent control, minimum wages, and elasticities of supply and demand and how they affect tax incidence. So in this chapter, we'll be exploring how elasticities of supply and demand affect tax incidence. So what does this mean? Well, when a good is taxed, who will pick up the tab? We will also look at price floors, price ceilings, and how floor ceilings and taxes lead to market failures. So let us start off with floors and ceilings. So price ceiling um, is a government imposed limit on the price charge for a product. Governments intend price ceilings to protect consumers from conditions that could make necessary commodities unobtainable. However, a price ceiling can cause problems if imposed for a long period of time without controlled rationing. Price ceilings can produce negative results when the correct solution would have been to increase supply. Misuse occurs when governments misdiagnose a price as too high when the problem is that the supply is too low. In an unregulated market economy, such as perfect, uh, perfectly competitive markets, price ceilings do not exist. Students, such as yourself, may sometimes incorrectly perceive a price ceiling to be above the supply and demand curve when in fact an effective price ceiling is imposed below the equilibrium position on a graph. When it is imposed underneath the equilibrium spot, it is binding and shortages occur. Why do shortages occur? Because if we go horizontally on our x and y axes, from the left to the right, we cross the supply curve before the demand curve. So what is a price floor? A price floor can be set above the free market equilibrium price. In this case, the floor has no practical effect. It is above the equilibrium price and therefore that floor is ineffective. The government has mandated a minim minimum price, but the market already bears a higher price. With a price floor set above free market price, it, is, it has a measurable impact. I actually said that backwards when the price floor is below the, the, the equilibrium point, it has no practical effect. Um, so the government has mandated a minimum, minimum price, but the market has already bears a higher price. With a price floor set above free market price, the price floor has a measurable impact on the market. It ensures prices stay high so that the product can continue to be made. A price floor set above the market equilibrium price has several side effects. Consumers, consumers find they must now pay a higher price for the same product. As a result, they reduce their purchases to drop out of the market entirely. Meanwhile, suppliers find that they are guaranteed a new and higher price that they were willing to charge before. As a result, they increase production. So let's neatly summarize this. Price ceilings above equilibrium are ineffective. Price ceilings below equilibrium are effective, but shortages result. Price floors below equilibrium are ineffective. Price floors above equilibrium are effective, but surpluses result. Can't remember how I said it the last time, but that's in summary and that's the correct way. All right, so rent controls. The rental accommodation market suffers from inf information asymmetries and high transaction costs. Typically, a landlord has more information about a home than a prospective tenant can reasonably detect. Moreover, once the tenant has moved in, the costs of moving again are very high. Unscrupulous landlords could conceal defects and, if the tenant complains, threaten to raise the rent at the end of the lease. With rent control, tenants can request that hidden defects, if they exist, be repaired to comply with building code requirements without fearing retaliation, rent retaliatory rent increases. Rent control could thus compensate somewhat for inefficiencies of the housing market. The goal of rent control is to help the poor by making housing more affordable. Rent control differs in the long run and the short run. In the short run, the availability of housing is more limited than in the long run. In the long run, there can be new houses or apartments built and the demand for housing can change as well. So, with short run supply being very or even perfectly inelastic, rent control only increases, a, or uh, sorry, rent control, um, so in the short run, the supply being very or even perfectly inelastic, 
rent control only creates a small shortage. But in the long run, with the supply and demand curves being much more elastic, there appears to be a larger shortage. Rent control is a form of price ceiling. Price floors, like price ceilings, are an attempt by the government to maintain a reasonable and affordable price. This price is not at equilibrium level, but if we take economic costs into the equation, such as time costs of searching for an apartment, or the time it takes to move into a new apartment, then the floor may be much more effective than one's intuition may lead to believe. So moving on to minimum wages. So these are my own sort of thoughts on minimum wage, and they may not necessarily be found in your book, but it's a kind of cool tidbit that I thought was worth sharing. So unemployment rates. Well, they include people who are searching for work actively, but they do not include students, the elderly who are retired, or discouraged workers. What are discouraged workers? Discouraged workers are those who have stopped looking for work. Therefore, when the minimum wage is increased, Sometimes the increase is enough to encourage some of the discouraged workers to re-enter the unemployment force. So when the minimum wage increases, the unemployment rate may go up as well. So how about those who do, who do not look for who do not work for minimum wage, like skilled labor? Well, when we consider skilled labor, they are paid at a wage over and above minimum wage. So the changes of minimum wage do not affect their decisions about working. When the supply of potential labor increases due to the increase in minimum wage, the supply curve shifts out and we see unemployment rates increase. So why don't we move on to taxes right now. So when the government imposes a tax, who bears the burden? Well, this is called tax incidence and it is dependent on elasticities of supply and demand. So let's make a long story short. You need to draw it out. That is the easiest way to do it. So when the supply curve is elastic and the demand curve is inelastic, consumers pay most of the tax. When the supply curve is inelastic and the demand curve is elastic, sellers pay most of the tax. When a tax is levied on sellers, the supply curve shifts up equilibrium quantity falls, and the price buyers pay rises. Even though the tax is levied on sellers, buyers and sellers share the burden of the tax. When a tax is levied on buyers and the demand curve, or when a tax is levied on buyers, the demand curve shifts down. Equilibrium quantity falls, and the price that sellers receive falls as well. The price buyers pay rises, and even though the tax is levied on buyers, buyers and sellers share the burden of the tax. So let's look at some elasticities. Here we see a supply and demand curve with completely equal elasticities. With a tax on suppliers, we see the shift of the supply curve. And when we look at these three important points in red, we now see that uh, with equal elasticities, the tax burden will be shared equally by both consumer and seller. This is usually not the case in real, in real life, in practice, but it's a good example. So now let's look at what happens with an elastic demand curve and an inelastic supply curve. Here we see supply and demand in equilibrium. But when there is a tax on sellers, we see the supply curve shift, and now we look at these three important points in red. Now we see with an elastic demand, and an inelastic supply, the tax burden is mostly taken on by the seller. Now this is an extreme case with an extreme elasticity. The elasticities will change, but the key thing to look at is the difference between the two rectangles. Whoever has a larger rectangle bears the brunt of the burden. Alright guys, well that was chapter 6. It was a quick run through. And if you, do, if you, in fact, do need more clarification on this, please see your TAs. Hope this was helpful. This was Chapter 6. My name is Radek. See you in Chapter 7.